she was, it seems, strongly affected at the ball by the sudden appearance of one Mr. Gordon, who strongly resembles the said Wilson, but I am rather suspicious that she caught cold by being overheated with dancing I have consulted Dr. Gregory, an eminent physician of an amiable character, who advises the Highland air, and the use of goat milk whey, which, surely, cannot have a bad effect upon a patient who was born and bred among the mountains of Wales the doctor's opinion is the more agreeable, as we shall find those remedies in the very place which I proposed as the utmost extent of our expedition I mean the borders of Argyle. Mr. Smollett, one of the judges of the commissary court, which is now sitting, has very kindly insisted upon our lodging at his country house. On the banks of Loch Lomond, about 14 miles beyond Glasgow. 4. This last city we shall set out in two days, and take Stirling in our way. Well provided with recommendations from our friends at Edinburgh, whom, I protest, I shall leave with much regret. I am so far from thinking it any hardship to live in this country, that, if I was obliged to lead a town life, Edinburgh would certainly be the headquarters of yours always, Matt. Bramble Eden, August 8th. To Sir Watkin Phillips, Bart. Of Jesus College, Oxon. Dear Knight. I am now little short of the Ultima Thule, if this appellation properly belongs to the Orkneys or Hebrides. These last are now lying before me, too. The amount of some hundreds, scattered up and down the Decolidnian Sea. Affording the most picturesque and romantic prospect I ever beheld I write this letter in a gentleman's house, near the town of Inverary which may be deemed the capital of the West Highlands, famous for nothing so much as for the stately castle begun, and actually covered in by the late Duke of Argyle, at a prodigious expense whether it will ever be completely finished is a question. But, to take things in order we left Edinburgh ten days ago, and the further north we proceed, we find Mrs. Tabitha the less manageable, so that her inclinations are not of the nature of the lodestone, they point not towards the pole. What made her leave Edinburgh with reluctance at last, if we may believe her own assertions, was a dispute which she left unfinished with Mr. Moffat, touching the eternity of hell torments. That gentleman, as he advanced in years, began to be sceptical on this head. Till, at length, he declared open war against the common acceptation of the word eternal. He is now persuaded, that eternal signifies no more than an indefinite number of years, and that the most enormous sinner may be quit for nine millions, nine hundred thousand, nine hundred and ninety-nine years of hell fire, which term or period, as he very well observes, forms but an inconsiderable drop, as it were, in the ocean of eternity for this mitigation he contends, as a system agreeable to the ideas of goodness and mercy, which we annex to the supreme being are, and seemed willing to adopt this doctrine in favor of the wicked, but he hinted that no person whatever was so righteous as to be exempted entirely from punishment in a future state, and that the most pious Christian upon earth might think himself very happy to get off for a fast of seven or eight thousand years in the midst of fire and brimstone. Mrs. Tabitha revolted at this dogma, which filled her at once with horror and indignation she had recourse to the opinion of Humphrey Clinker, who roundly declared it was the popish doctrine of purgatory, and quoted scripture in defense of the fire everlasting, prepared for the devil and his angels the Reverend Master Maccor Kendall, and all the theologists and saints of that persuasion were consulted, and some of them had doubts about the matter, which doubts and scruples had begun to infect our aunt, when we took our departure from Edinburgh. We passed through Linlithgow, where there was an elegant royal palace, which is now gone to decay, 
as well as the town itself this too is. Pretty much the case with Stirling, though it still boasts of a fine old castle in which the kings of Scotland were wont to reside in their minority but Glasgow is the pride of Scotland, and, indeed, it might very well pass for an elegant and flourishing city in any part of Christendom. There we had the good fortune to be received into the house of Mr. Moore, an eminent surgeon, to whom we were recommended by one of our friends at Edinburgh, and, truly, he could not have done us more essential. Service Mr. Moore is a merry facetious companion, sensible and shrewd, with a considerable fund of humor, and his wife an agreeable woman, well-bred, kind, and obliging. Kindness, which I take to be the essence of good nature and humanity, is the distinguishing characteristic of the Scotch ladies in their own country our landlord shoot us everything, and introduced us to all the world at Glasgow, where, through his recommendation, we were complimented with the freedom of the town. Considering the trade and opulence of this place, it cannot but abound with gaiety and diversions. Here is a great number of young fellows that rival the youth of the capital in spirit and expense, and I was soon convinced that all the female beauties of Scotland were not assembled at the Hunter's Ball in Edinburgh the town of Glasgow flourishes in learning as well as in commerce here is an university, with professors in all the different branches of science, liberally endowed and judiciously chosen it was vacation time when I passed, so that I could not entirely satisfy my curiosity, but their mode of education is certainly preferable to ours in some respects. The students are not left to the private instruction of tutors, but taught in public schools or classes, each science by its particular professor or regent. My uncle is in raptures with Glasgow he not only visited all the manufactures of the place, but made excursions all round to Hamilton, Paisley, Renfrew, and every other place within a dozen miles, where there was anything remarkable to be seen in art or nature. I believe the exercise, occasioned by those jaunts, was of service to my sister Liddy whose appetite and spirits begin to revive Mrs. Tabitha displayed her attractions as usual, and actually believed she had entangled one M.R. McClellan, a rich inkle manufacturer, in her snares, but when matters came to an explanation, it appeared that his attachment was altogether spiritual, founded upon an intercourse of devotion, at the meeting of M.R. John Wesley, who, in the course of his evangelical mission, had come hither in person at length, we set out for the banks of Loch Lomond, passing through the little borough of Dumbarton, or, as my uncle will have it, Dunbritton, where there is a castle, more curious than anything of the kind I had ever seen. It is honored with a particular description by the elegant Buchanan, as an arx inexpugnabilis, and Indeed, it must have been impregnable by the antient manner of besieging. It is a rock of considerable extent, rising with a double top, in an angle. Formed by the confluence of two rivers, the Clyde and the Laban. Perpendicular and inaccessible on all sides, except in one place where the entrance is fortified, and there is no rising ground in the neighborhood. From whence it could be damaged by any kind of battery. From Dumbarton, the West Highlands appear in the form of huge, dusky mountains, piled one over another, but this prospect is not at all surprising to a native of Glamorgan we have fixed our headquarters. At Cameron, a very neat country house belonging to Commissary Smollett, where we found every sort of accommodation we could desire it is. Situated like a druid's temple, in a grove of oak, close by the side of Loch Lomond, which is a surprising body of pure transparent water. Unfathomably deep in many places, six or seven miles broad, four and twenty miles in length, displaying above twenty green islands, covered 
with wood, some of them cultivated for corn, and many of them stocked with red deer they belong to different gentlemen, whose seats are scattered along the banks of the lake, which are agreeably romantic beyond all conception. My uncle and I have left the women at Cameron, as MRS. Tabitha would by no means trust herself again upon the water, and to come hither it was necessary to cross a small inlet of the sea, in an open ferry boat this country appears more and more wild and savage the further we advance, and the people are as different from the lowland Scots, in their looks, garb, and language, as the mountaineers of Brecknock are from the inhabitants of Herefordshire. When the lowlanders want to drink a chirruping cup, they go to the public house, called the change house, and call for a chopin of two penny, which is a thin, yeasty beverage, made of malt, not quite so strong as the table beer of England. This is brought in a pewter stoop, shaped like a skittle, from whence it is emptied into a quaff, that is, a curious cup made of different pieces of wood, such as box and ebony, cut into little staves, joined alternately, and secured with delicate hoops, having two cars or handles it holds about a gill, is sometimes tipped round the mouth with silver, and has a plate of the same metal at bottom, with the landlord's cipher engraved the Highlanders, on the contrary, despise this liquor, and regale themselves with whiskey, a malt spirit, as strong as Geneva, which they swallow in great quantities, without any signs of inebriation. They are used to it from the cradle, and find it an excellent preservative against the winter cold, which must be extreme on these mountains I am told that it is given with great success to infants, as a cordial in the confluent smallpox, when the eruption seems to flag, and the symptoms grow unfavorable the Highlanders are used to eat much more animal food than falls to the share of their neighbors. In the low country they delight in hunting, have plenty of deer and other game, with a great number of sheep, goats and black cattle running wild, which they scruple not to kill as vention, without being much at pains to ascertain the property. Inverary is but a poor town, though it stands immediately under the protection of the Duke of Argyle, who is a mighty prince in this part of Scotland. The peasants live in wretched cabins, and seem very poor, but the gentlemen are tolerably well lodged, and so loving to strangers, that a man runs some risque of his life from their hospitality it must be. Observe that the poor Highlanders are now seen to disadvantage. They have been not only disarmed by act of parliament, but also deprived of their ancient garb, which was both graceful and convenient, and what is a greater hardship still, they are compelled to wear breeches, a restraint, which they cannot bear with any degree of patience, indeed, the majority wear them, not in the proper place, but on poles or long staves over their shoulders they are even debarred the use of their striped stuff, called tartan, which was their own manufacture, prized by them above all, the velvets, brocades and tissues of Europe and Asia. They now lounge along in loose greatcoats, of coarse russet, equally mean and cumbersome and betray manifest marks of dejection certain it is, the government could not have taken a more effectual method to break their national spirit. We have had princely sport in hunting the stag on these mountains. These are the lonely hills of Morven, where Fingal and his heroes enjoyed the same pastime, I feel an enthusiastic pleasure when I survey the brown heat that Ashen want to tread, and hear the wind whistle through the Bending grass when I enter our landlord's hall, I look for the suspended harp of that divine bard, and listen in hopes of hearing the aerial sound of his respected spirit. The poems of Ossian are in every mouth of famous antiquarian of this country, the laird of Macfarlane, at whose house we dined a few days ago, can repeat them all in the original Gaelic, 
which has a great affinity to the Welsh, not only in the general sound, but also in a great number of radical words, and I make no doubt that they are both sprung from the same origin. I was not a little surprised, when asking a Highlander one day, if he knew where we should find any game. He replied, who Neil Sassenach, which signifies no English, the very same answer I should have received from a Welshman, and almost in the same words. The Highlanders have no other name for the people of the Low Country, but Sassenach, or Saxons, a strong presumption that the lowland Scots and the English are derived from the same stock. The peasants of these hills strongly resemble those of Wales in their looks, their manners, and habitations, everything I see and hear and feel. Seems Welch the mountains, vales, and streams, the air and climate. The beef, mutton, and game, are all Welch it must be owned, however. That this people are better provided than we in some articles they have plenty of red deer and roebuck, which are fat and delicious at this season of the year. Their sea teems with amazing quantities of the finest fish in the world, and they find means to procure very good claret at a very small expense. Our landlord is a man of consequence in this part of the country, a cadet. From the family of Argyle and hereditary captain of one of his castles his name, in plain English, is Dougal Campbell, but as there is a great number of the same appellation, they are distinguished, like the Welsh, by patronymics, and as I have known an antient Briton called Maddock A.P. Morgan, A.P. Jenkin, A.P. Jones, our Highland chief designs himself Doel Macamish. Macolichan, signifying Dougal, the son of James, the son of Dougal, the son of John. He has traveled in the course of his education, and is disposed to make certain alterations in his domestic economy, but he finds it impossible to abolish the ancient customs of the family, some of which are ludicrous enough his piper for example, who is an hereditary officer of the household, will not part with the least particle of his privileges. He has a right to wear the kilt, or ancient highland dress, with the purse, pistol, and duerk a broad yellow ribbon, fixed to the chanter pipe, is thrown over his shoulder, and trails along the ground, while he performs the function of his minstrelsy, and this, I suppose, is analogous to the pennon or flag which was formerly carried. Before every night in battle he plays before the laird every Sunday in his way to the kirk, which he circles three times, performing the family march which implies defiance to all the enemies of the clan and every morning he plays a full hour by the clock in the great hall marching backwards and forwards all the time with a solemn pace attended by the laird's kinsmen who seem much delighted with the music in this exercise he indulges them with a variety of pibrochs or airs suited to the different passions which he would either excite or assuage. Mr. Campbell himself, who performs very well on the violin, has an invincible antipathy to the sound of the Highland bagpipe, which sings in the nose with a most alarming twang, and, indeed, is quite intolerable to ears of common sensibility, when aggravated by the echo of a vaulted hall he therefore begged the piper would have some mercy upon him, and dispense with this part of the morning service a consultation of the clan. Being held on this occasion, it was unanimously agreed, that the Laird's request could not be granted without a dangerous encroachment upon the customs of the family the piper declared, he could not give up for a moment the privilege he derived from his ancestors, nor would the Laird's relations forego an entertainment which they valued above all others there. Was no remedy, Mr. Campbell, being obliged to acquiesce, is fain to stop his ears with cotton, to fortify his head with three or four nightcaps, and every morning retire into the penetralia of his habitation, in order to avoid this diurnal annoyance. 
when the music ceases, he produces himself at an open window that looks into the courtyard, which is by this time filled with a crowd of his vassals and dependents, who worship his first appearance, by uncovering their heads, and bowing to the earth with the most humble prostration. As all these people have something to communicate in the way of proposal, complaint, or petition, they wait patiently till the laird comes forth, and, following him in his walks, are favored each with a short audience in his turn. Two days ago, he dispatched above an hundred different solicitors, in walking with us to the house of a neighboring gentleman, where we dined by invitation. Our landlord's housekeeping is equally rough and hospitable, and savors much of the simplicity of ancient times, the great hall, paved with flat stones, is about 45 feet by 22, and serves not only for a dining room, but also for a bedchamber, to gentlemen dependents and hangers-on of the family. At night, half a dozen occasional beds are ranged on each side along the wall. These are made of fresh heath, pulled up by the roots, and disposed in such a manner as to make a very agreeable couch, where they lie, without any other covering than the plaid my uncle and I were indulged with separate chambers and down beds which we begged to exchange for a layer of heath, and indeed I never slept so much. To my satisfaction, it was not only soft and elastic, but the plant, being in flower, diffused an agreeable fragrance, which is wonderfully refreshing and restorative. Yesterday we were invited to the funeral of an old lady, the grandmother of a gentleman in this neighborhood, and found ourselves in the midst of fifty people, who were regaled with a sumptuous feast, accompanied by the music of a dozen pipers. In short, this meeting had all the air of a grand festival, and the guests did such honor to the entertainment, that many of them could not stand when we were reminded of the business on which we had met. The company forthwith taking horse, rode in a very irregular cavalcade to the place of interment, a church, at the distance of two long miles from the castle. On our arrival, however, we found we had committed a small oversight, in leaving the corpse behind, so we were obliged to wheel about, and met the old gentlewoman halfway, being carried upon poles by the nearest relations of her family, and attended by the coronach, composed of a multitude of old hags, who tore their hair, beat their breasts, and howled most hideously. At the grave, the orator, or Sinachia, pronounced the panegyric of the defunct, every period being confirmed by a yell of the coronach. The body was committed to the earth. The pipers playing a pibroch all the time, and all the company standing. Uncovered. The ceremony was closed with the discharge of pistols, then we. Returned to the castle, resumed the bottle, and by midnight there was not. A sober person in the family, the females accepted. The squire and I. Were, with some difficulty, permitted to retire with our landlord in the evening, but our entertainer was a little chagrined at our retreat, and afterwards seemed to think it a disparagement to his family, that not above a hundred gallons of whiskey had been drunk upon such a solemn occasion. This morning we got up by four, to hunt the roebuck, and, in half an hour, found breakfast ready served in the hall. The hunters consisted of Sir George Calhoun and me, as strangers, my uncle not chussing to be of the party, of the laird in person, the laird's brother, the laird's brother's son, the laird's sister's son, the laird's father's brother's son, and all their foster brothers, who are counted parcel of the family, but we were attended by an infinite number of gale lease, or ragged highlanders without shoes or stockings. The following articles formed our morning's repast, one kit of boiled 
eggs, a second, full of butter, a third full of cream, an entire cheese. Made of goat's milk, a large earthen pot full of honey, the best part of a ham, a cold venison pasty, a bushel of oatmeal, made in thin cakes and bannocks, with a small wheaten loaf in the middle for the strangers, a large stone bottle full of whiskey, another of brandy, and a kilderkin of ale. There was a ladle chained to the cream kit, with curious wooden beakers to be filled from this reservoir. The spirits were drank out of a silver quaff, and the ale out of hams, great justice was done to the collation by the guest in general, one of them in particular ate above two dozen of hard eggs, with a proportionable quantity of bread, butter, and honey, nor was one drop of liquor left upon the board. Finally, a large roll of tobacco was presented by way of desert, and every individual took a comfortable quid, to prevent the bad effects of the morning air. We had a fine chase over the mountains, after a roebuck, which we killed, and I got home time enough to drink tea with Mrs. Campbell and our squire. Tomorrow we shall set out on our return for Cameron. We propose to cross the Frith of Clyde, and take the towns of Greenock and Port Glasgow in our way. This circuit being finished, we shall turn our faces to the south and follow the sun with augmented velocity, in order to enjoy the rest of the autumn in England, where Boreas is not quite so biting as he begins already to be on the tops of these northern hills. But our progress from place to place shall continue to be specified in these detached journals. Of yours always, J. Melford Argyleshire, September 3. To Dr. Lewis. Dear Dick. About a fortnight is now elapsed, since we left the capital of Scotland. Directing our course towards Stirling, where we lay. The castle of this place is such another as that of Edinburgh, and affords a surprising prospect of the windings of the River Forth, which are so extraordinary that the distance from hence to Alloa by land is but forty miles, and by water it is twenty four. Alloa is a neat, thriving town that depends in a great measure on the commerce of Glasgow the merchants of which send hither tobacco and other articles, to be deposited in warehouses for exportation from the Frith of Forth. In our way hither we visited a flourishing iron work, where, instead of burning wood, they use coal, which they have the art of clearing in such a manner as frees it from the sulfur, that would otherwise render the metal too brittle for working. Excellent coal is found in almost every part of Scotland. The soil of this district produces scarce any other grain but oats, lid, barley, perhaps because it is poorly cultivated, and almost altogether unenclosed. The few enclosures they have consist of paltry walls of loose stones gathered from the fields, which indeed they cover, as if they had been scattered on purpose when I expressed my surprise that the peasants did not disencumber their grounds of these stones, a gentleman, well, acquainted with the theory as well as practice of farming, assured me that the stones, far from being prejudicial, were serviceable to the crop. This philosopher had ordered a field of his own to be cleared, manured, and sown with barley, and the produce was more scanty than before. He caused the stones to be replaced, and next year the crop was as good as ever. The stones were removed a second time, and the harvest failed, they were again brought back, and the ground retrieved its fertility. The same experiment has been tried in different parts of Scotland with the same success astonished. At this information, I desired to know in what manner he accounted for this strange phenomenon, and he said there were three ways in which the stones might be serviceable. They might possibly restrain an excess in the perspiration of the earth, analogous to colliquative sweats, by which the 
human body is sometimes wasted and consumed. They might act as so many. Fences to protect the tender blade from the piercing winds of the spring. Or, by multiplying the reflection of the sun, they might increase the warmth, so as to mitigate the natural chillness of the soil and climate but, surely this excessive perspiration might be more effectually checked by different kinds of manure, such as ashes, lime, chalk, or marl, of which last it seems there are many pits in this kingdom, as for the warmth, it would be much more equally obtained by enclosures, the cultivation would require less labor, and the plows, harrows, and horses, would not suffer half the damage which they now sustain. These northwestern parts are by no means fertile in corn. The ground is naturally barren and moorish. The peasants are poorly lodged, meager in their looks, mean in their apparel, and remarkably dirty. This last reproach they might easily wash off, by means of those lakes, rivers, and rivulets of pure water, with which they are so liberally supplied by nature. Agriculture cannot be expected to flourish where the farms are small, the leases short, and the husbandman begins upon a rack rent, without a sufficient stock to answer the purposes of improvement. The granaries of Scotland are the banks of the Tweed, the counties of East End, Midlothian, the Cars of Gowry, in Perthshire, equal in fertility to any part of England, and some tracts in Aberdeenshire and Murray, where I am told the harvest is more early than in Northumberland, although they lie above two degrees farther north. I have a strong curiosity to visit many places beyond the Forth and the Tay, such as Perth, Dundee, Montrose, and Aberdeen, which are towns equally elegant and thriving, but the season is too far advanced to admit of this addition to my original plan. I am so far happy as to have seen Glasgow, which, to the best of my recollection and judgment, is one of the prettiest towns in Europe, and, without all doubt, it is one of the most flourishing in Great Britain. In short, it is a perfect beehive in point of industry. It stands partly on a gentle declivity, but the greatest part of it is in a plain, watered by the River Clyde. The streets are straight, open, airy, and well paved, and the houses lofty and well built of hewn stone. At the upper end of the town, there is a venerable cathedral, that may be compared with York Minster or Westminster, and, about the middle of the descent from this to the cross, is the college, a respectable pile of building, with all manner of accommodation for the professors and students including an elegant library, and an observatory well provided with astronomical instruments. The number of inhabitants is said to amount to 30,000, and marks of opulence and independency appear in every quarter of this commercial city, which, however, is not without its inconveniences and defects. The water of their public pumps is generally hard and brackish, an imperfection the loss excusable, as the river Clyde runs by their doors, in the lower part of the town, and there are rivulets and springs above the cathedral, sufficient to fill a large reservoir with excellent water, which might be thence distributed to all the different parts of the city. It is of more consequence to consult the health of the inhabitants in this article than to employ so much attention in beautifying their town with new streets, squares, and churches. Another defect, not so easily remedied, is the shallowness of the river, which will not float vessels of any burthen within 10 or 12 miles of the city, so that the merchants are obliged to load and unload their ships at Greenock and Port Glasgow, situated about 14 miles nearer the mouth of the Frith, where it is about 2 miles broad. The people of Glasgow have a noble spirit of enterprise Mr. Moore, a surgeon, to whom I was recommended from Edinburgh, introduced me to all 
the principal merchants of the place. Here I became acquainted with Mr. Cochrane, who may be styled one of the sages of this kingdom. He was first magistrate at the time of the last rebellion. I sat as member when he was examined in the House of Commons, upon which occasion Mr. P. observed. He had never heard such a sensible evidence given at that bar. I was also introduced to Dr. John Gordon, a patriot of a truly Roman spirit, who is the father of the linen manufacture in this place, and was the great promoter of the city workhouse, infirmary, and other works of public utility. Had he lived in ancient Rome, he would have been honored with a statue at the public expense. I moreover conversed with one Mr. G. S. S. F. D., whom I take to be one of the greatest merchants in Europe. In the last war, he is said to have had at one time five and twenty ships with their cargoes, his own property, and to have traded for above half a million sterling a year. The last war was a fortunate period for the commerce of Glasgow the merchants, considering that their ships bound for America, launching out at once into the Atlantic by the north of Ireland, pursued a track very little frequented by privateers, resolved to ensure one another, and saved a very considerable sum by this resolution, as few or none of their ships were taken you must know I have a sort of national attachment to this part of Scotland the great church, dedicated to St. Manga, the River Clyde, and other particulars that smack of our Welch language and customs, contribute to flatter me with the notion, that these people are the descendants of the Britons, who once possessed this country. Without all question, this was a Cumbrian kingdom. Its capital was Dumbarton, a corruption of Dunbritton, which still exists. As a royal borough, at the influx of the Clyde and Laban, ten miles below Glasgow. The same neighborhood gave birth to St. Patrick, the Apostle of Ireland, at a place where there is still a church and village, which retain his name. Hard by are some vestiges of the famous Roman wall, built in the reign of Antonine, from the Clyde to the Forth, and fortified with castles, to restrain the incursions of the Scots or Caledonians, who inhabited the West Highlands. In a line parallel to this wall, the merchants of Glasgow have determined to make a navigable canal betwixt the two firths which will be of incredible advantage to their commerce, in transporting mercandise from one side of the island to the other. From Glasgow we travelled along the Clyde, which is a delightful stream, adorned on both sides with villas, towns, and villages. Here is no want of groves and meadows and cornfields interspersed, but on this side of Glasgow, there is little other grain than oats and barley, the first are much better, the last much worse, than those of the same species in England. I wonder, there is so little rye, which is a grain that will thrive in almost any soil, and it is still more surprising, that the Cultivation of potatoes should be so much neglected in the highlands, where the poor people have not meal enough to supply them with bread. Through the winter, on the other side of the river are the towns of Paisley and Renfrew. The first, from an inconsiderable village, is become one of the most flourishing places of the kingdom, enriched by the linen, cambric, flowered lawn, and silk manufactures. It was formerly noted for a rich monastery of the monks of Clugny, who wrote the famous Skatai Chronicon, called the Black Book of Paisley. The old abbey still remains, converted into a dwelling house, belonging to the Earl of Dundonald. Renfrew is a pretty town, on the banks of Clyde, capital of the Shire, which was heretofore the patrimony of the Stuart family, and gave the title of Baron to the King's eldest son, which is still assumed by the Prince of Wales. The Clyde we left a little on our left hand at Dunbritton, where it widens into an estuary or frith, 
being augmented by the influx of the Laban. On this spot stands the castle formerly called al Clud, washed, by these two rivers on all sides, except a narrow isthmus, which at every springtide is overflowed. The whole is a great curiosity, from the quality and form of the rock, as well as from the nature of its situation we now cross the water of Laban, which, though nothing near so considerable as the Clyde, is much more transparent, pastoral, and delightful. This charming stream is the outlet of Loch Lomond, and through a tract of four miles pursues its winding course, murmuring over a bed of pebbles, till it joins the Frith at Dunbritton, a very little above its source, on the lake, stands the house of Cameron, belonging to Mr. Smollett, so embosomed in an oak wood, that we did not see it till we were within fifty yards of the door. I have seen the Lago de Garda, Albano, Davico, Bolsina, and Geneva, and, upon my honor, I prefer Loch Lomond to them all, a eh? preference which is certainly owing to the verdant islands that seem to float upon its surface, affording the most enchanting objects of repose to the excursive view. Nor are the banks destitute of beauties, which even partake of the sublime. On this side they display a sweet variety of woodland, cornfield, and pasture, with several agreeable villas emerging as it were out of the lake, till, at some distance, the prospect terminates in huge mountains covered with heath, which being in the bloom, affords a very rich covering of purple. Everything here is romantic. Beyond imagination. This country is justly styled the Arcadia of Scotland. And I don't doubt but it may be with Arcadia in everything but climate I. I'm sure it excels it in verdure, wood, and water what say you to a natural basin of pure water, near 30 miles long, and in some places 7 miles broad, and in many above a hundred fathom deep, having 4 and 20 habitable islands, some of them stocked with deer, and all of them covered with wood, containing immense quantities of delicious fish, salmon, pike, trout, perch, flounders, eels, and pawans, the last a delicate kind of freshwater herring peculiar to this lake, and finally, communicating with the sea, by sending off the laven, through which all those species, except the pawan, make their exit and entrance. Occasionally, enclosed I send you the copy of a little ode to this river, by Dr. Smollett, who was born on the banks of it, within two miles of the place. Where I am now writing it is at least picturesque and accurately descriptive, if it has no other merit there is an idea of truth in an agreeable landscape taken from nature, which pleases me more than the gayest fiction which the most luxuriant fancy can display. I have other remarks to make, but as my paper is full, I must reserve them. Till the next occasion. I shall only observe at present, that I am determined to penetrate at least forty miles into the highlands, which now appear like a vast fantastic vision in the clouds, inviting the approach of yours always, Matt. Bramble Cameron, August 28th. Ode to Laban Water. On Laban's banks, while free to rove, and tune the rural pipe to love, I envied not the happiest swain that ever trod th Arcadian plain. Pure stream. In whose transparent wave my youthful limbs I want to lave. No torrents stain thy limpid source, no rocks impede thy dimpling course. That sweetly warbles o'er its bed, with white, round, polished pebbles. Spread, while, lightly poised, the scaly brood in myriads cleave thy. Crystal flood, the springing trout in speckled pride, the salmon, monarch. Of the tide, the ruthless pike, intent on war, the silver eel, and mottled. P.A.R. Asterisk. Devolving from thy parent lake, a charming maze thy waters make, by bowers. Of birch, and groves of pine, 
and hedges flow rd with eglantine. Still on thy banks so gaily green, may number rouse herds and flocks be seen. And lasses chanting o'er the pale, and shepherds piping in the dale, and ancient faith that knows no guile, and industry embrowned with toil, and hearts resolved, and hands prepared, the blessings they enjoy to guard. Asterisk the par is a small fish, not unlike the smelt, which it rivals in delicacy and flavor. To Dr. Lewis. Dear Doctor. If I was disposed to be critical, I should say this house of Cameron is too near the lake, which approaches, on one side, to within six or seven yards of the window. It might have been placed in a higher site, which would have afforded a more extensive prospect and a drier atmosphere, but this imperfection is not chargeable on the present proprietor, who purchased it ready-built, rather than be at the trouble of repairing his own family house of Bonhill, which stands two miles from hence on the Laban, so surrounded with plantation, that it used to be known by the name of the Mavis, or Thrush, Nest. Above that house is a romantic glen or cliff of a mountain, covered with hanging woods having at bottom a stream of fine water that forms a number of cascades in its descent to join the Laban, so that the scene is quite enchanting. A captain of a man of war, who had made the circuit of the globe with Mr. Anson, being conducted to this glen, exclaimed, Juan Fernandez, by God. Indeed, this country would be a perfect paradise, if it was not, like Wales, cursed with a weeping climate, owing to the same cause in both, the neighborhood of high mountains, and a westerly situation, exposed to the vapors of the Atlantic Ocean. This air, however, notwithstanding its humidity, is so healthy, that the natives are scarce ever visited by any other disease than the smallpox, and certain cutaneous evils, which are the effects of dirty living, the great and general reproach of the commonalty of this kingdom. Here are a great many living monuments of longevity, and among the rest a person, whom I treat with singular respect, as a venerable druid, who has lived near ninety years, without pain or sickness, among oaks of his own planting he was once proprietor of these lands, but being of a projecting spirit, some of his schemes miscarried, and he was obliged to part with his possession, which hath shifted hands two or three times since that period, but every succeeding proprietor hath done everything in his power, to make his old age easy and comfortable. He has a sufficiency to procure the necessaries of life, and he and his old woman reside in a small convenient farmhouse, having a little garden which he cultivates with his own hands. This ancient couple live in great health, peace, and harmony, and, knowing no wants, enjoy the perfection of content. Mr. Smollett calls him the Admiral, because he insists upon steering his pleasure boat upon the lake, and he spends most of his time in ranging through the woods, which he declares he enjoys as much as if they were still his own property I asked him the other day, if he was never sick, and he answered, yes, he had a slight fever the year before the Union. If he was not deaf, I should take much pleasure in his conversation, for he is very intelligent, and his memory is surprisingly retentive these are the happy effects of temperance, exercise, and good nature notwithstanding all his innocence. However, he was the cause of great perturbation to my man Clinker, whose natural superstition has been much injured, by the histories of witches, fairies, ghosts, and goblins, which he has heard in this country on. The evening after our arrival, Humphrey strolled into the wood, in the course of his meditation, and all at once the admiral stood before him, under the shadow of a spreading oak. Though the fellow is far from being timorous in cases that are not supposed preternatural, he could not stand 
the sight of this apparition, but ran into the kitchen, with his hair. Standing on end, staring wildly, and deprived of utterance. Mrs. Jenkins. Seeing him in this condition, screamed aloud, Lord have mercy upon us, he. Has seen something. Mrs. Tabitha was alarmed, and the whole house in. Confusion. When he was recruited with a dram, I desired him to explain the meaning of all this agitation, and, with some reluctance, he owned he had seen a spirit, in the shape of an old man with a white beard, a black cap, and a plaid nightgown. He was undeceived by the admiral in person, who, coming in at this juncture, appeared to be a creature of real flesh and blood. Do you know how we fare in this Scottish paradise? We make free with our landlord's mutton, which is excellent, his poultry yard, his garden, his dairy, and his cellar, which are all well stored. We have delicious salmon, pike, trout, perch, par, and sea at the door, for the taking. The Frith of Clyde, on the other side of the hill, supplies us with mullet. Red and grey, cod, mackerel, whiting, and a variety of sea fish, including the finest fresh herrings I ever tasted. We have sweet, juicy beef, and tolerable veal, with delicate bread from the little town of Dunbritton. And plenty of partridge, grows, heathcock, and other game in presents. We have been visited by all the gentlemen in the neighborhood, and they have entertained us at their houses, not barely with hospitality, but with such marks of cordial affection, as one would wish to find among near relations, after an absence of many years. I told you, in my last, I had projected an excursion to the Highlands, which project I have now happily executed, under the auspices of Sir George Calhoun, a colonel in the Dutch service, who offered himself as our conductor on this occasion, leaving our women at Cameron, to the care and inspection of Lady H.C., we set out on horseback for Inverary, the county town of Argyle, and dined on the road with the Laird of Macfarlane, the greatest genealogist I ever knew in any country, and perfectly acquainted with all the antiquities of Scotland. The Duke of Argyle has an old castle in Inverary, where he resides when he is in Scotland, and hard by is the shell of a noble Gothic palace, built by the last duke, which, when finished, will be a great ornament to this part of the Highlands. As for Inverary, it is a place of very little importance. This country is amazingly wild, especially towards the mountains, which are heaped upon the backs of one another, making a most stupendous appearance of savage nature, with hardly any signs of cultivation, or even of population. All is sublimity, silence, and solitude. The people live together in glens or bottoms, where they are sheltered from the cold and storms of winter, but there is a margin of plain ground spread along the seaside, which is well inhabited and improved by the arts of husbandry and this I take to be one of the most agreeable tracks of the whole island, the sea not only keeps it warm, and supplies it with fish, but affords one of the most ravishing prospects in the whole world, I mean the appearance of the Hebrides, or western islands to the number of three hundred, scattered as far as the eye can reach, in the most agreeable confusion as the soil and climate of the highlands are but ill adapted to the cultivation of corn, the people apply themselves chiefly to the breeding and feeding of black cattle, which turn to good account. Those animals run wild all the winter, without any shelter or subsistence, but what they can find among the heath, when the snow lies so deep and hard, that they cannot penetrate to the roots of the grass, they make a diurnal progress, guided by a sure instinct, to the seaside at low water, where they feed on the alga marina, 
and other plants that grow upon the beach. Perhaps this branch of husbandry, which required very little attendance and labor, is one of the principal causes of that idleness and want of industry, which distinguishes these mountaineers in their own country. When they come forth into the world, they become as diligent and alert as any people upon earth. They are undoubtedly a very distinct species from their fellow subjects of the lowlands, against whom they indulge in ancient spirit of animosity, and this difference is very discernible even among persons of family and education. The lowlanders are generally cool and circumspect, the highlanders fiery and ferocious but this violence of their passion serves only to inflame the zeal of their devotion to strangers, which is truly enthusiastic. We proceeded about twenty miles beyond Inverary, to the house of a gentleman, a friend of our conductor, where we stayed a few days, and were feasted in such a manner, that I began to dread the consequence to my constitution. Notwithstanding the solitude that prevails among these mountains, there is no want of people in the highlands. I am credibly informed that the Duke of Argyle can assemble five thousand men in arms, of his own clan and surname, which is Campbell, and there is besides a tribe of the same appellation, whose chief is the Earl of Albine. The Macdonalds are as numerous, and remarkably warlike, the Camerons, M. Liads, Frasers, Grants, M. Kenzies, M. Ks, M. Fersons, M. Intoshes, are powerful clans, so that if all the Highlanders, including the inhabitants of the Isles, were united, they could bring into the field an army of 40,000 fighting men, capable of undertaking the most dangerous enterprise. We have lived to see 4,000 of them, without discipline, throw the whole kingdom of Great Britain into confusion. They attacked and defeated two armies of regular troops accustomed to service. They penetrated into the center of England, and afterwards marched back with deliberation, in the face of two other armies, through an enemy's country, where every precaution was taken to cut off their retreat. I know not any other people in Europe, who, without the use or knowledge of arms, will attack regular forces sword in hand, if their chief will head them in battle. When disciplined, they cannot fail of being excellent soldiers. They do not walk like the generality of mankind, but trot and bounce like deer, as if they moved upon springs. They greatly excel the lowlanders in all the exercises that require agility, they are incredibly abstemious, and patient of hunger and fatigue so steeled against the weather, that in traveling, even when the ground is covered with snow, they never look for a house, or any other shelter but their plaid, in which they wrap themselves up, and go to sleep under the cope of heaven. Such people, in quality of soldiers, must be invincible, when the business is to perform quick marches in a difficult country, to strike sudden strokes, beat up the enemy's quarters, harass their cavalry, and perform expeditions without the formality of magazines, baggage, forage, and artillery. The chieftainship of the Highlanders is a very dangerous influence operating at the extremity of the island, where the eyes and hands of government cannot be supposed to see and act with precision and vigor. In order to break the force of clanship, administration has always practiced the political maxim, divide. E.T. Impera. The legislature hath not only disarmed these mountaineers, but also deprived them of their antient garb, which contributed in a great measure to keep up their military spirit, and their slavish tenures are all dissolved by act of parliament, so that they are at present as free and independent of their chiefs, as the law can make them, but the original attachment still remains, and is founded on something prior to the feudal system, 
about which the writers of this age have made such a pother, as if it was a new discovery, like the Copernican system. Every peculiarity of policy, custom, and even temperament, is effectively traced to this origin, as if the feudal constitution had not been common to almost all the natives of Europe. For my part, I expect to see the use of trunk hose and butterdale ascribed to the influence of the feudal system. The connection between the clans and their chiefs is, without all doubt, patriarchal. It is founded on hereditary regard and affection, cherished through a long succession of ages. The clan consider the chief as their father, they bear his name, they believe themselves descended from his family, and they obey him as their lord, with all the ardour of filial love and veneration, while he, on his part, exerts a paternal authority, commanding, chastising, rewarding, protecting, and maintaining them as his own children. If the legislature would entirely destroy this connection, it must compel the Highlanders to change their habitation and their names. Even this experiment has been formerly tried without success in the reign of James VI. The battle was fought within a few short miles of this place, between two clans, the M. Gregors and the Calhouns, in which the latter were defeated. The Laird of M. Gregor made such a barbarous use of his victory, that he was forfeited and outlawed by Act of Parliament, his lands were given to the family of Montrose, and his clan were obliged to change their name. They obeyed so far, as to call themselves severally Campbell, Graham, or Drummond, the surnames of the families of Argyle, Montrose, and Perth, that they might enjoy the protection of those houses. But they still added M. Gregor to their new appellation, and as their chief was deprived of his estate, they robbed and plundered for his subsistence Mr. Cameron of Lochiel, the chief of that clan, whose father was Adoint IV. Having been concerned in the last rebellion, returning from France in obedience to a proclamation and act of parliament, passed at the beginning of the late war, paid a visit to his own country and hired a farm in the neighborhood of his father's house, which had been burnt to the ground. The clan, though ruined and scattered, no sooner heard of his arrival than they flocked to him from all quarters, to welcome his return, and in a few days stocked his farm with seven hundred black cattle, which they had saved in the general wreck of their affairs, but their beloved chief, who was a promising youth, did not live to enjoy the fruits of their fidelity and attachment. The most effectual method I know to weaken, and at length destroy this influence, is to employ the commonalty in such a manner as to give them a taste of property and independence. In vain the government grants them advantageous leases on the forfeited estates, if they have no property to prosecute the means of improvement the sea is an inexhaustible fund of riches, but the fishery cannot be carried on without vessels, casks, salt, lines, nets, and other tackle. I conversed with a sensible man of this country, who, from a real spirit of patriotism had set up a fishery on the coast, and a manufacture of coarse linen, for the employment of the poor highlanders. Cod is here in such plenty, that he told me he had seen several hundred taken on one line, at one haul it must be observed. However, that the line was of immense length, and had two thousand hooks, baited with mussels, but the fish was so superior to the cod caught on the banks of Newfoundland, that his correspondent at Lisbon sold them immediately at his own price, although Lent was just over when they arrived, and the people might be supposed quite cloyed with this kind of Diet his linen manufacture was likewise in a prosperous way, when the late war intervening, all his best hands were pressed into the service. It cannot be expected that the gentlemen of this country should execute 
commercial schemes to render their vassals independent, nor, indeed, are such schemes suited to their way of life and inclination, but a company of merchants might, with proper management, turn to good account a fishery. Established in this part of Scotland our people have a strange itch to colonize America, when the uncultivated parts of our own island might be settled to greater advantage. After having rambled through the mountains and glens of Argyle, we visited the adjacent islands of Isla, Jura, Mull, and Icomkill. In the first, we saw the remains of a castle, built in a lake, where MacDonald, Lord Orr, King of the Isles, formerly resided. Jura is famous for having given birth to one Mac Crane, who lived 180 years in one house, and died in the reign of Charles II. Mull affords several bays, where there is safe anchorage, in one of which, the Florida, a ship of the Spanish Armada, was blown up by one of Mr. Smollett's ancestors about. Forty years ago, John Duke of Argyle is said to have consulted the Spanish registers, by which it appeared, that this ship had the military chest on board he employed experienced divers to examine the wreck, and they found the hull of the vessel still entire, but so covered with sand, that they could not make their way between decks, however, they picked up several pieces of plate, that were scattered about in the bay, and a couple of fine brass cannon. Icolmkil, or Iona, is a small island which St. Columba chose for his habitation it was respected for its sanctity, and college or seminary of ecclesiastics part of its church is still standing, with the tombs of several Scottish, Irish, and Danish sovereigns, who were here. Interred these islanders are very bold and dexterous watermen. Consequently the better adapted to the fishery, in their manners they are less savage and impetuous than their countrymen on the continent, and they speak the earth or Gaelic in its greatest purity. Having sent round our horses by land, we embarked in the distinct of Cowal, for Greenock, which is a neat little town, on the other side of the Frith, with a curious harbour formed by three stone jetties, carried out a good way into the sea Newport Glasgow is such another place, about two miles higher up. Both have a face of business and plenty, and are supported entirely by the shipping of Glasgow, of which I counted sixty large vessels in these harbours taking boat again at Newport, we were in less than an hour landed on the other side, within two short miles of our headquarters, where we found our women in good health and spirits. They had been two days before joined by Mr. Smollett and his lady, to whom we have such obligations as I cannot mention, even to you, without blushing. Tomorrow we shall bid adieu to the Scotch Arcadia, and begin our progress. To the southward, taking our way by Lanark and Nithsdale, to the west. Borders of England. I have received so much advantage and satisfaction from this tour, that if my health suffers no revolution in the winter, I believe I shall be tempted to undertake another expedition to the northern extremity of Caithness, unencumbered by those impediments which now clog the heels of yours, Matt. Bramble Cameron, September 6. To Miss Laetitia Willis, at Gloucester. My dearest Letty, never did poor prisoner long for deliverance, more than I have longed for an opportunity to disburthen my cares into your friendly bosom, and the occasion which now presents itself, is little less than miraculous honest. Saunders Macaulay, the travelling Scotchman, who goes every year to Wales, is now at Glasgow, buying goods and coming to pay his respects to our family has undertaken to deliver this letter into your own hand we have been six weeks in Scotland, and seen the principal towns of the kingdom, where we have been treated with great civility the people are very courteous, and the country being exceedingly romantic, suits my 
turn and inclinations I contracted some friendships at Edinburgh, which is a large and lofty city, full of gay company, and, in particular, commenced an intimate correspondence with one Miss R.T.N., an amiable young lady of my own age, whose charm seemed to soften, and even to subdue the stubborn heart of my brother Jerry, but he no sooner left the place than he relapsed into his former insensibility I feel. However, that this indifference is not the family constitution I never admitted but one idea of love, and that has taken such root in my heart, as to be equally proof against all the pulls of discretion, and the frosts of neglect. Dear Letty, I had an alarming adventure at the Hunter's Ball in Edinburgh while I sat discoursing with a friend in a corner, all at once the very image of Wilson stood before me, dressed exactly as he was in the character of Aimwell. It was one Mr. Gordon, whom I had not seen before shocked at the sudden apparition, I fainted away, and threw the whole assembly in confusion however, the cause of my disorder remained a secret to everybody but my brother, who was likewise struck with the resemblance and scolded after we came home I am very sensible of Jerry's affection, and know he spoke as well with a view to my own interest and happiness, as in regard to the honor of the family, but I cannot bear to have my wounds probed severely I was not so much affected by the censure he passed upon my own indiscretion, as with the reflection he made on the conduct of Wilson. He observed, that if he was really the gentleman, he pretended to be, and harbored nothing but honorable designs, he would have vindicated his pretensions in the face of day this remark made. A deep impression upon my mind I endeavored to conceal my thoughts. And this endeavor had a bad effect upon my health and spirits, so it was thought necessary that I should go to the highlands, and drink the goat milk way. We went accordingly to Loch Lomond, one of the most enchanting spots in the whole world, and what with this remedy, which I had every morning, fresh from the mountains, and the pure air, and cheerful company, I have recovered my flesh and appetite, though there is something still at bottom, which it is not in the power of air, exercise, company, or medicine to remove these incidents would not touch me so nearly, if I had a sensible confidant to sympathize with my affliction, and comfort me with wholesome advice I have nothing of this kind, except when Jenkins, who is really a good body in the main, but very ill qualified for such an office the poor creature is weak in her nerves, as well as in her understanding, otherwise I might have known the true name and character of that unfortunate youth but why do I call him? unfortunate. Perhaps the epithet is more applicable to me for having listened to the false professions of but, hold. I have as yet no right, and sure I have no inclination to believe anything to the prejudice of his honor in that reflection I shall still exert my patience. As for Mrs. Jenkins, she herself is really an object of compassion between vanity, methodism, and love her head is almost turned. I should have more regard for her, however, if she had been more constant in the object of her affection, but, truly, she aimed at conquest, and flirted at the same time with my uncle's footman, Humphrey Clinker, who is really a deserving young man, and one Dutton, my brother's valet de chamber, a debauched fellow, who, leaving Wynne in the lurch, ran away with another man's bride at Berwick. My dear Willis, I am truly ashamed of my own sex we complain of advantages which the men take of our youth, inexperience, insensibility, and all that, but I have seen enough to believe, that our sex in general make it their business to ensnare the other, and for this purpose, employ arts which are by no means to be justified in point of constancy. They certainly have nothing to reproach the male part of the creation my poor aunt, 
without any regard to her years and imperfections, has gone to market with her charms in every place where she thought she had the least chance to dispose of her person, which, however, hangs still heavy on her. Hence I am afraid she has used even religion as a decoy, though it has not answered her expectation she has been praying, preaching, and Kate Kaising among the Methodists, with whom this country abounds, and pretends to have such manifestations and revelations, as even Clinker himself can hardly believe, though the poor fellow is half crazy with enthusiasm. As for Jenkins, she affects to take all her mistresses. Reveries for gospel. She has also her heart heavings and motions of the spirit, and God forgive me if I think uncharitably, but all this seems to me to be downright hypocrisy and deceit perhaps, indeed, the poor girl imposes on herself she is generally in a flutter, and is much subject to vapours since we came to Scotland, she has seen apparitions, and pretends to prophesy if I could put faith in all. These supernatural visitations, I should think myself abandoned of grace. For I have neither seen, heard, nor felt anything of this nature, although I endeavor to discharge the duties of religion with all the sincerity, zeal, and devotion, that is in the power of Dear Letty, your ever affectionate, Lydia Melford Glasgow, September 7. We are so far on our return to Brambleton Hall, and I would fain hope we shall take Gloucester in our way, in which case I shall have the inexpressible pleasure of embracing my dear Willis Pray remember me. To my worthy governess. To Mrs. Mary Jones, at Brambleton Hall. Dear Mary. Sunders Macaulay, the Scotchman, who pushes directly for Vales, has promised to give it you into your own hand, and therefore I would not miss the opportunity to let you know as I am still in the land of the living. And yet I have been on the brink of the other world since I sent you my last letter we went by sea to another kingdom called Fife, and coming back, had like to have gone to pot in a storm what between the fright and sickness, I thought I should have brought my heart up, even. Mr. Clinker was not his own man for eight and forty hours after we got ashore. It was well for some folks that we scaped drowning, for mistress was very fractious, and seemed but indifferently prepared for a change. But, thank God, she was soon put in a better frame by the private exaltations of the Reverend Mr. Macrocodile we afterwards turned to. Starling and Grascow, which are a keeple of handsome towns, and then we went to a gentleman's house at Laflomaying, which is a wonderful sea of fresh water, with a power of highlands in the midst on tea they say as how it has any are a bottom, and was made by a musician and, truly, I believe it, for it is not in the course of nature it has got waves without wind, fish without fins, and a floating highland, and one of them is a crutch yard, where the dead are buried, and always before the person dies. A bell rings of itself to give warning. Oh Mary! This is the land of congregation the bell knolled when we were there I saw lights, and heard lamentations the gentleman, our landlord, has got another house, which he was fain to quit. On account of a mischievous ghost, that would not suffer people to lie in their beds. The fairies dwell in a hole of caremen, a mounting hard by. And they steal away the good women that are in the straw, if so be as how. There ain't a horseshoe nailed to the door, and I was shown an old bitch. Called Elspeth Ring Avy, with a red petticoat, bleared eyes, and a mold. Of grey bristles on her sin that she muffed do me no harm, I. Crossed her hand with a taster, and bid her tell my fortune, and she told. Me such things describing Mr. Clinker to a hair but it shall ne'er be. Said, that I mentioned a word of the matter as I was troubled with. Fitz, she advised me to bathe in the loft, which was holy water, and so I. Went in the morning to a private place along with the housemaid, and we. Bathed in our birthday suit, 
after the fashion of the country, and behold. Whilst we dabbled in the loft, Sir George Coon started up with a gun, but. We clapped our hands to our faces, and passed by him to the place where we. Had left our smocks a civil gentleman would have turned his head. Another way my comfort is, he knew not which was which, and, as the. Saying is, all cats in the dark are grey whilst we stayed at. Laflomaying, he and our two squires went three or four days churning among. The wild men of the mountains, a parcel of selvages that lie in caves. Among the rocks, devour young children, speak Welsh, but the boards are. Different. Our ladies would not part with Mr. Clinker, because he is so. Stout and so pie house, that he fears neither man nor devils, if so be as. They don't take him by surprise indeed, he was once so flurried by. An apparition, that he had liked to have sounded he made believe as. If it had been the old admiral, but the old admiral could not have made. His air to stand on end, and his teeth to shatter, but he said so in. Prudence, that the ladies must not be afeard. Miss Liddy has been puny. And like to go into a decline I doubt her poor art is too tender but. The Gott's Fay has set her on her legs again you now's Gott's Fay is. Mother's milk to a Welsh woman. As for mistress, blessed be God, she ails. Nothing her stomach is good, and she improves in grease and. Godliness, but, for all that, she may have infections like other people. And I believe, she wouldn't be sorry to be called your ladyship, whenever. Sir George thinks proper to ax the question but, for my part. Whatever I may see or hear, not a practical shall ever pass the lips of. Dear Molly, your loving friend, Win. Jenkins Grasco, September 7. Remember me, as usual, to Saul we are now coming home, though not. The nearest road I do suppose, I shall find the kitten a fine boar. At my return. To Sir Watkin Phillips, Bart. At Oxon. Dear knight. Once more I tread upon English ground, which I like not the worse for the six weeks ramble I have made among the woods and mountains of Caledonia. No offense to the land of cakes, where bannocks grow upon straw. I never saw my uncle in such health and spirits as he now enjoys. Liddy is perfectly recovered, and Mrs. Tabitha has no reason to complain. Nevertheless, I believe, she was, till yesterday, inclined to give the whole Scotch nation to the devil, as a pack of insensible brutes, upon whom her accomplishments had been displayed in vain at every place. Where we halted, did she mount the stage, and flourished her rusty arms, without being able to make one conquest. One of her last essays was against the heart of Sir George Calhoun, with whom she fought all the Weapons more than twice over she was grave and gay by turns she. Moralized and methodized she laughed and romped and danced, and. Sung, and sighed, and ogled, and lisped, and fluttered, and flattered but. All was preaching to the desert. The baronet, being a well-bred man. Carried his civilities as far as she could in conscience expect, and, if. Evil tongues are to be believed some degrees farther, but he was too much. A veteran in gallantry, as well as in war, to fall into any ambuscade that she could lay for his affection while we were absent in the highlands, she practiced also upon the laird of Ladrishmar, and even gave him the rendezvous in the wood of Drumscalic, but the laird had such a reverent care of his own reputation, that he came attended with the parson of the parish, and nothing passed but spiritual communication. After all, these miscarriages, our aunt suddenly recollected Lieutenant Lisma Hago, whom, ever since our first arrival at Edinburgh, she seemed to have utterly forgot, but now she expressed her hopes of seeing him at Dumfries. According to his promise, we set out from Glasgow by the way of Lanark, the county town of Clydesdale, in the neighborhood of which, the whole river Clyde, rushing 
down a steep rock, forms a very noble and stupendous cascade. Next day we were obliged to halt in a small burrow, until the carriage, which had received some damage, should be repaired, and here we met with an incident which warmly interested the benevolent spirit of Mr. Bramble as we stood at the window of an inn that fronted the public prison, a person arrived on horseback, genteelly, though plainly, dressed in a blue frock, with his own hair cut short, and a gold-laced hat upon his head alighting, and giving his horse to the landlord, he advanced to an old man who was at work in paving the street, and accosted him in these words, this is hard work for such an old man as you. So saying, he took the instrument out of his hand, and began to thump the pavement after a few strokes, have you never a son, said he, to ease you of this labor. Yes, and please your honor, replied the senior, I have three hopeful lads, but, at present, they are out of the way. Honor not me, cried the stranger, but more becomes me to honor your gray hairs. Where are those sons you talk of? The ancient Pavy Hour said, his eldest son was a captain in the East Indies, and the youngest had lately enlisted as a soldier, in hopes of prospering like his brother. The gentleman desiring to know what was become of the second, he wiped his eyes, and owned, he had taken upon him his old father's debts, for which he was now in the prison hard by. The traveller made three quick steps towards the jail, then turning short. Tell me, said he, has that unnatural captain sent you nothing to relieve? Your distress. Call him not unnatural, replied the other, God's. Blessing be upon him. He sent me a great deal of money, but I made a bad. Use of it. I lost it by being security for a gentleman that was my landlord, and was stripped of all I had in the world besides. At that instant a young man, thrusting out his head and neck between two iron bars in the prison window, exclaimed, Father, Father, if my brother William is in life, that's he. I am, I am, cried the stranger, clasping the old man in his arms, and shedding a flood of tears, I am your son Willie, sure enough. Before the father, who was quite confounded, could make any return to this tenderness, a decent old woman, bolting out from the door of a poor habitation, cried, Where is my bairn? Where is my dear Willie? The captain no sooner beheld her, than he quitted his father, and ran into her embrace. I can assure you, my uncle, who saw and heard everything that passed, was as much moved as any one of the parties concerned in this pathetic recognition he sobbed and wept and clapped his hands, and hollowed, and finally ran down into the street. By this time, the captain had retired with his parents, and all the inhabitants of the place were assembled at the door Mr. Bramble, nevertheless, pressed through the crowd, and entering the house, Captain, said he, I beg the favor of your acquaintance. I would have traveled a hundred miles to see this affecting scene, and I shall think myself happy if you and your parents will dine with me at the public house. The Captain thanked him for his kind invitation, which, he said, he would accept with pleasure, but in the Meantime, he could not think of eating or drinking, while his poor brother was in trouble. He forthwith deposited a sum equal to the debt in the hands of the magistrate, who ventured to set his brother at liberty. Without farther process, and then the whole family repaired to the inn. With my uncle, attended by the crowd, the individuals of which shook their townsmen by the hand, while he returned their caresses without the least sign of pride or affectation. This honest favorite of fortune, whose name was Brown, told my uncle that he had been bred a weaver, and, about eighteen years ago, had, from a 
spirit of idleness and dissipation, enlisted as a soldier in the service of the East India Company, that, in the course of duty, he had the good fortune to attract the notice and approbation of Lord Clive, who preferred him from one step to another, till he attained the rank of captain and paymaster to the regiment, in which capacities he had honestly amassed above twelve thousand pounds, and, at the peace, resigned his commission he had sent several remittances to his father, who received the first only, consisting of one hundred pounds, the second had fallen into the hands of a bankrupt, and the third had been consigned to a gentleman of Scotland, who died before it arrived, so that it still remained to be accounted for by his executors. He now presented the old man with fifty pounds for his present occasions, over and above banknotes for one hundred, which he had deposited for his brother's release he brought along with him a deed ready executed, by which he settled a perpetuity of fourscore pounds upon his parents, to be inherited by their other two sons after their decease he promised to purchase a commission for his youngest brother, to take the other as his own partner in a manufacture which he intended to set up, to give employment and bread to the industrious, and to give five hundred pounds, by way of dower, to his sister, who had married a farmer in low circumstances. Finally, he gave fifty pounds to the poor of the town where he was born, and feasted all the inhabitants. Without exception. My uncle was so charmed with the character of Captain Brown, that he drank his health three times successively at dinner he said, he was proud of his acquaintance, that he was an honor to his country, and had in some measure redeemed human nature from the reproach of pride, selfishness, and ingratitude for my part, I was as much pleased with the modesty as with the filial virtue of this honest soldier, who assumed no merit from his success, and said very little of his own transactions, though the answers he made to our inquiries were equally sensible and laconic, MRS. Tabitha behaved very graciously to him until she understood that he was going to make a tender of his hand to a person of low estate, who had been his sweetheart while he worked as a journeyman weaver our aunt was no sooner made acquainted with them, than she starched up her